the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In 21 days, we will not be standing here at this time. We will be probably having breakfast. And then we'll be getting ready for Agape Vespers. In 21 days, it is Pascha. So, very soon, very soon. So this is the fourth Sunday of Great Lent. And we read about the, the, um, the demoniac. This is just before the Passion of the Lord, not very much before at all. Transfiguration is exactly 40 days before Good Friday. He had just been coming off the mountain, so it was probably the day that he came off the mountain that he encountered this man with the demoniac son. So. 39 days later, 40 days later, would be the Lord would be crucified. So things were wrapping up, shall we say. And he was trying to get his disciples to understand. So this healing is important for their understanding. Because he gave them an important piece of information, several important pieces of information. And so let's go through a, sort of the, the beginning a little bit, not, not too much of the detail, because I want to get to the things that really are amazing. So, the Lord is coming off the mountain, off my table. This man had come to his disciples, the ones that were left, because only Peter and James and John went up to Mount Tabor with him. And they asked, the, the man asked those disciples to heal his son. Now, he was aware that there had been healings before. Demoniacs, even raising the dead, all these things had happened. So he thought that Jesus would, would that the disciples could raise the, see heal his son, heal his son, excuse me, because they had gone out by two by two and there had been healings done by the disciples. But they were unable to heal him. The boy was still possessed. So he comes to the Lord and he tells him, Master, I have brought thee my son who hath a dumb spirit and wherever he takes him, he... He tears him, he foams, and he gnashes with his teeth, and he pineth away. I asked your, your disciples to cast him out, but they could not. That wasn't very nice. Not a very nice way to ask for a healing is to colloquially, you know, say that he's throwing the other people under the bus. Shouldn't have said that. That was a judgmental thing to say. So he answers and, and says, Oh, faithful, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? And, and other things. And I, I don't really want to go into those details too much because I want to go to the aftermath of the healing. There's a lot of important things. A lot of symbolism, a lot of very important things. Of course, the man says, I believe, help my unbelief. Very important. <laughs> so when he's healed, the disciples that could not heal him probably were embarrassed. Probably their pride was stricken a little bit. They couldn't do it. They wanted to be able to do something when the master was gone. Of course, you always want to show that, you know, uh, see, I can do this. I can do this. Well, they couldn't. So they go to him and they ask him, why could we not cast him out? Now, here's where if you read the other accounts, you read Matthew and read Luke, you'll get some other information. So I want to talk about it. So he says, in one place it says, because of your lack of faith. But here in Mark, it's a little more direct. He says, this kind cannot come out except by prayer and fasting. Now, in Matthew, he says, if you have faith as the grain of a mustard, he says that, but he also says, if you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible with you. And, of course, we know those of you who read the lives of the saints, there's occurrences where mountains did move, literally. Sometimes inadvertently, but sometimes on purpose. So Luke doesn't give that detail, but he gives this other detail very directly, which is interesting because Luke usually isn't as um, so emphatic as, as Mark is. And of course, Mark is writing the memoirs of the Apostle Peter. So in Mark, he gets right to the point. Time and time again. And there's this intensity. Luke 
was a scholar and was a doctor, and so he wrote in a more reserved way. Not this time. So he says, this kind does not come out by prayer and fasting. Then he says, let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them, and they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. So putting these things together, we know that that demon did not come out except by prayer and fasting, or would not if uh, anyone other than our Lord Jesus Christ exercised the demon. And we know, if you are scripturally aware and uh, knowing the the, the tradition of the church, that the Lord is not referring not just to demons, but also to deeply embedded passions. So, if you don't think you have a demon, well, you're probably correct. Huh? But you do have very deeply embedded passions. And those passions will not come out, except by prayer and fasting. Now, fasting, perhaps, is somewhat self-explanatory. Different people have different ways they fast. Some people are very lazy with their fasting. You shouldn't be. Some people give themselves certain, you know, exceptions. You shouldn't unless you have health reasons. But everybody has a different kind of, at least understands fasting and that there are foods that you don't eat during certain periods of time. I think prayer is misunderstood more than fasting. And either one is not really exercised very much, unfortunately, in our day. So prayer is not just the thing that you say. It's your whole life. It's your whole direction in life. It's your whole purpose in life. It's the things that you hold to be important. It's the way that you interact with people. It's the way you think. It's everything. Because the Lord said through Paul in Thessalonians, excuse me, sort of Paul was listing some things to do, and he says, pray without ceasing. As if it was obvious that you pray without ceasing. And obviously, at every moment in time, you are not saying a prayer. You can't do that when you're reading a children's book to somebody, unless you're very good at uh, multitasking. There are times when you're not going to be saying a prayer, either aloud or in your head, but you can be prayerful. So, I think that the Luke's admonition, or the Lord's admonition re reported by Luke, helps us to understand something about this being prayerful. The disciples were enjoying so much being with Jesus. There were miracles. There was beautiful preaching. His presence, of course, was just otherworldly, literally, and supernatural. And they always wanted to be with him. Just before the miracle, Peter, talking out of his head on Mount Tabor, said, let's make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elias. He was thinking they could be up on that mountain forever and just be with the Lord. But that's not the way life is. The life is not just being up on a mountain forever. You go up to a mountain to pray, to prepare yourselves, and then you go down into the valley and you work. So I think that the Lord was trying, not only was he trying to educate them that he was about to be crucified, 40 days later he'd be crucified. Not very long at all. But also, there has to be a mindfulness about us. This is where we really are lacking. We have to have mindfulness about, about our purpose in life, all times. We pray in the St. Ephraim prayer all the time against idleness, right? Idleness. Idleness is basically just living according to whatever you're doing. Not living really about God. Thinking about God occasionally, God occasionally perhaps at appointed times of prayer, or perhaps you read a little scripture, etc. But not really where God is uppermost in everything that you do, everything you say, that always the presence of God is, is you're aware of him. Of course, he's always present, but we're not always aware of his presence. So the disciples wanted Jesus to be with him um, all the time, but it wasn't going to be that way. Forty days later, he was going to be crucified. They were all going to be terrified. They are all going to run away. They're going to be afraid that they would be killed. Peter was going to deny the Lord three times. Mark, who wrote this, was going to run away from the garden naked because he was afraid. When they grabbed after his clothes, he ran away naked. All these things were going to happen, and they weren't ready for them. They weren't ready for them because the saying was too hard. They didn't want to go into it too much. 
Because it was a scary saying that he's going to die, that he's going to be crucified, that he's going to be judged by the Jewish leader. They didn't want to believe it. It was right in front of them. He was telling them over and over again, and they saw how the Jewish leaders had tried to kill him before. In the first year of his ministry, they tried to kill him. And this now was the third, maybe three and a half. So they should have been aware, but they weren't because they they weren't mindful. So there has to be mindfulness in prayer. There has to be mindfulness in the way you live. If you're mindful, then you will pray in, in a sober way. Very, very important. Now, how do you get this mindfulness? I talk to you about it all the time. I, I really think it's a it's a endemic problem in the human nature that we're not mindful, we're not careful. We are distracted by so many things. And now we moderns have things that distract us that we put in our pockets, don't we? We have all these things that ancient people didn't have to deal with. We have all these things. So I tell you, you read the lives of the saints. If you're not reading the lives of the saints, then you're just cheating yourself. Cheating yourself. The che- a cheating that you're not aware of. It's like, you know, you go through a day, today seemed okay. No, it wasn't. Today was a tragedy for you because you didn't do something that brought you higher. The reading lives of the saints, I always tell you to do prostrations. They're so critical. And having a regular prayer rule, praying for others, especially the people that make your heart kind of shrink a little bit or get a little angry or flinty when you think about them. All those things are so important. The services, we're kind of going a little down on the services now. People are a little, you know, the weekday services, people are having a tough time getting there. And now we're coming up this week, some important things. We have the great canon. We have the laudations of the Theotokos. You shouldn't miss those things. You shouldn't miss those things. You should consider it a terrible tragedy if you miss those things. Now, I'm not giving you these things as a, as a laundry list or grocery list. This is, not, this is not the case. It's not a box that you check. But if it's important to you, then you will be doing these things. I remember once reading about some really good guitarist. He got a guitar, he didn't go to school hardly, he flunked out and stuff, but he'd play guitar 15, 16 hours a day. His hands would be raw, and he'd have to put tape on them, and he'd still play guitar, because he loved guitar. Now, guitar is something that's going to go away, especially in the lifestyle that he chose. But that's what he did. That's how much he valued guitar. How much do we value Christianity? We have so many distractions. So if you're going to pray with your heart, You're going to have to live with your heart, which means outside of the appointed times of prayer, formal times of prayer, which you must have, you must then, you must live in a a sober way, a careful way. The scripture talks about it. We have it, we read it today from St. John in the Ladder. It kind of describes the way Mark's live. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Sometimes people think, oh, our days are so terrible. Look at the things that are happening. Uh, now we have you know, a lot of saber rattling in the Middle East. People are thinking, could there be World War III, et cetera, et cetera. People have been thinking, will there be a war from the beginning of time? And if there will be World War III, I don't know. If there is, what are you going to do about the most important war? That's not the most important war. The most important war is the war for you to be with God no matter what. For Satan not to snatch your soul away. That's your most important war. That's my most important war. All the other things that are happening, well, they're going to happen. So we must walk circumspectly. We must be sober in the way we live. Be careful about the things that we consume, the things that are important to us. Etc. Etc. And then you can be able to have better prayer, but you have to work at it. You have to work at it. So there's another aspect of prayer that I want to talk about. There's something that I recently published from Saint Ephrem, 
in his spiritual psalter, so-called. He didn't think he was writing the spiritual psalter. He was just writing all kinds of things. And in the middle of his writing, he'd have this, these beautiful prayers. And they were excerpted by St. Theophon the Recluse. And it's an amazing book. And I do a lot of publishing based upon the psalter. And every time people say, where can I get it? Well, you get it from Amazon for like $300. Because it's not in print right now. It's, too, it's sad. But hopefully that will be rectified. It's just one of the best. It's a, a desert island. Let's put it that way, you know. I always am reading it every day. So when the disciples saw that, that they couldn't expel the demon, and they asked, how does this happen? Prayer and fasting. fasting, And they're just thinking, who could be saved? I, I, how can we do this? But that's from another context. But they were still saying that kind of thing. How can we ever measure up? We couldn't expel the demon. He does it pretty easily. We did it when he told us to do go walk two by two. Why couldn't we do it now? Lack of faith and because they didn't have enough prayer and fasting. So how do you obtain those things when you think, I just can't get it done? Which one of us here doesn't have something in our life that seems insurmountable? It seems too big. Every single one of us does. Except maybe the little babies, they don't think about those things yet. What are you going to do about those things? Well, you can say, I believe, help my unbelief. That's an excellent thing to copy out and pray every day. You can do prostrations, asking for help. You can do all those things. And those are things are important. One of the things that I do, sort of as a, if you want to call it a hobby, is... I'm always reading from various sources, especially the scriptures, the Psalter in general, um, besides the scriptures, you know, besides the gospel and the epistles. Uh, the writings of St. Isaac the Syrian and uh, St. Ephraim. And in those things, and as well as some other places, there are sometimes spontaneous prayers and or beautiful things that I just copy out and sometimes I share them with you and I add them to my daily prayer room. And this is one of those things. And it's such a powerful, beautiful prayer. It's so unlike the prayer that I heard before I was orthodox. I never heard anything, anything like this at all, ever. So it goes like this. I have the will, but I cannot say that I have the strength. I give what I have. Consider my situation. And if it pleases thee to give me what I lack, grant it me. I beg only for grace. I confess that if I am to be saved, I shall be saved through thee. What an um, amazing prayer. What a realistic prayer. Somebody wrote to me and said, I don't even know if I have the will. So they wanted to modify it. And I said, God bless you. Help me to have the will. I don't have the will or even the strength. Modify it if you don't think you have the will. If you don't want to do something, perhaps you want to want to want. Perhaps you want to want to want to. Okay. You got to start with where you're at. You give what you have. You can't give what you don't have. It's not possible to give what you don't have. But if you give what you have, you'll be able to give more. That is such an important spiritual principle that we don't understand. We don't exercise. If you're a bad faster, then fast badly, but get a little better. Maybe, you, maybe you're eating cheese. Well, maybe you can not eat meat on Wednesdays and Fridays. Maybe you can say, okay, I won't eat chicken either. Etc., etc. You can improve incrementally. Now, this should be done with a blessing. You shouldn't do this secretly. You should talk to Father Nicholas or myself. But you give what you have. That's all we can do is give what we have. And develop the will so that we then God will see our will, our desire, and will give us the strength to fulfill what we desire. So this is a very good prayer to pray in the context of this demoniac. Because it was so impossible to the disciples. Impossible for them to be able to heal this boy. And the Lord did it with a word. That was it. But we can't do things just with a word most of the time because we're so sinful and we're so weak. So this is a very good prayer for you to copy out 
and for you to say every day. With a prostration, of course. I have the will, but I cannot say that I have the strength. I give what I have. Now, this is another situation. Or, or this is the same, uh, the same verse. Consider my situation, and if it pleases thee to give what I lack, grant it to me. So this shows is a model for prayer. So you say, I'm terrible, but I want to be better. The Our Father says that. The Saint, prayer of St. Ephraim says that. 15 or 20 of our Stakira last night said that. Basically, that's the model. I'm a sinner. I'm terrible. I'm wretched. But I believe. And I, I believe that I'm going to get you. Because you're going to help. That's the content of so many of our prayers. So beautiful. So cathartic to be able to pray that way. And something I never experienced until I became one of those. So, after the saint admits he has the will, but he doesn't have the strength. And this is a saint saying this. <laughs> what about us? And then he says, I give what I have, that important principle. Then he basically gives himself over to the will of God, like in the Arpan. My kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Consider my situation, and if it pleases thee to give me what I like, grant it to me. Well, the implication here is if it doesn't please thee to give what I like, don't give it to me. <laughs> if it pleases thee to give me something that's hard, please give it to me. In other words, whatever you want to do, please do it. Because that's what I need. But in order to be able to deal with that which I lack, or to be given something that's hard to do, have some difficulty brought upon me because of God's will, I need grace. So then he says, I beg only for grace. I confess that if I have to be saved, I shall be saved through thee. It's really a, a beautiful prayer. And I would really recommend that you would copy it out and uh, use it daily with a prostration. And if you do these two things that I've talked about, the idea that prayer is not just saying stuff, but it's doing stuff. It is everything you do, everything you are, Every, the way you approach life. And so you got a lot of changes to make regarding being able to be good at prayer. And then also to pray with this acceptance of our sinfulness, but also this, this confidence that God will help us and this desire to give everything we have and this acceptance of God's will for us. If we do that, then our prayer increases and we become stronger and we become more confident, and we become better. May God help us to do this, to pray with acceptance, to pray with fervor, to pray with confidence, to pray with humility. That's how you do it, by, having, by changing the way you live, ordering the way you live according to the gospel, and by praying with this kind of fervor and acceptance as I've given you the example of in St. Ephraim's prayer. May God bless you and help you in all things. Amen.